Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm very excited to, uh, to be here today, and I, I have um, I prepared a few things uh, that I'd like to share at, uh, at incredible speed to download as much uh, visual information on you guys, and then we can have a, a conversation afterwards. Um, uh, I'm an architect from, uh, from Denmark, and um, my mother has always reminded me that I have the proportions of a Lego man. Uh, and, uh, and she does have a point. Uh, and uh, so you can imagine, and the, the interesting thing about Lego is that Lego is a company that has succeeded in making everybody believe that Lego is from their home country, but it is from my home country. Uh, so uh, you can imagine the excitement uh, I felt when I got approached by the Lego family to help them design and build the home of the brick. Uh, here we are laying the foundations. Uh, 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 like s sturdy concrete uh, Lego bricks. Um, this was the first architectural model we, uh, we built, uh, and, and this is what it looks like uh, today. And uh, we tried to design uh, the Lego house uh, as inviting and as interactive as Lego itself. So the, uh, the roof is a series of interconnected playgrounds where everybody's invited to climb and sort of enjoy the views over the, the, uh, the sort of the town of, uh, of Bilon. Uh, also, um, the Lego house, um, these like blocks lift up, liberating the ground, creating a square that is also open to the public so the, the citizens of Bilon can roam around freely uh, inside the, the square. Uh, and, uh, and only if you actually want to go to the galleries do you actually have to buy a ticket, otherwise it's, it's just a public space. It's also, I think, interesting because it's probably one of the only museums in the world where you have to touch the artifacts. Uh, you can also descend down into a vault uh, underneath the, the Lego house where you can find this kind of uh, treasures of, of Lego history, including probably the coolest uh, Lego set ever built, uh, the Yellow Castle from 1979, my first uh, Lego set. Um, and, and, and then, of course, I, I was incredibly, you know, I almost shed a tear when I saw that we had become immortalized, that uh, our creation is now part of the vault. Uh, which is probably the highest honor any architect can ever dream of. Um, but, but I think what's, what's important about Lego is that Lego is not a toy. It's a tool. It's a tool that empowers the child to create his or her own world and then to inhabit that world through play and to invite her friends to join her in co-creating and cohabiting that world. And at, at its best, that is exactly what architecture is. We have this incredible power to realize the world we like to uh, find ourselves living in. And um, the, the Danish word for design is formgivning, which literally means form giving, uh, uh, like literally giving form to that which has not yet been given form, or in other words, to give form to the future, and more specifically, to give form to the future that we would like to find ourselves living in, in the future. So, so we have this incredible, incredible power. Just some examples of, of how you can shape uh, your world. Uh, uh, actually inspired by Lego uh, and the sort of modularity of Lego, we created uh, this uh, affordable housing project in Copenhagen, stacking rooms like Lego bricks, uh, but by leaving a little bit of a gap in between them, even though it's modular, we can actually create organic curves so you end up having this kind of almost sensual feeling. They step down to create terraces. Um, so anyway, the modularity and the repetition actually ends up becoming the, um, what, what enables the, the variation. A another example from uh, my hometown, Copenhagen, uh, the eight house that has sort of uh, combined uh, shops, kindergartens, uh, townhouses, uh, and apartments to create a, a sort of a man-made mountain where you can walk and bicycle all the way to the penthouse. Uh, so you have almost like a, a small-scale community with townhouses and gardens uh, in the middle of the city block. In Amsterdam, we've sort of turned the, the European courtyard inside out, allowing the port of Amsterdam to enter. Uh, so you can actually, if you have a straight aim, you can sail your ship in and dock inside the, uh, the building. Uh, and in New York, we try to take the European courtyard building and uh, combine it with the density of uh, an American skyscraper, uh, it, almost like putting a miniature central park in the heart of the city block. 
opening up to the views uh, over the Hudson, the sunset. Um, and, and one of the things we've been sort of consistently interested in over the, um, uh, the decades is to try to, uh, in a way, uh, change the perception of what sustainability is and needs to be. Because uh, uh, a decade and a half ago, we had this feeling that sustainability was suffering from this idea that it was always a question of almost like this Protestant idea that it has to hurt to do good, like taking cold showers in the morning. Um, so we thought, what if sustainable cities and buildings actually increase our uh, enjoyment? Um, the first example, we, we designed the Danish pavilion in Shanghai in 2010, where we tried to demonstrate how what makes Copenhagen more enjoyable to live in uh, also makes it more sustainable. So for instance, we brought the city bikes. Copenhagen was the first city in the world that had a free system of, uh, of bikes you could borrow. So you, we created a, a museum where you, where you could actually bike through the whole museum, making it the perfect museum for impatient people. Um, <laughs> also, we thought like uh, in, uh, in Copenhagen, our first project uh, that we ever realized uh, 16 years ago was the Copenhagen Harbor Bath. Uh, and it's because uh, the port of Copenhagen has become so clean that you can swim in it sort of reminding us that a clean port is not only nice for the fish, it's amazing for the citizens because they don't have to sit in the, their car for hours to get to the beach. They can actually jump in the port in the middle of town. So we moved that experience to, to China, allowing the visitors to experience how clean, uh, if not how cold, uh, Danish harbor water is. Um, and uh, to attract the Chinese, we were trying to find common denominators between Denmark and China. And, and, and we noticed that in the Chinese public school curriculum, they have three fairy tales by Hans Christian Andersen, one of them being the story of the mermaid, uh, the national symbol of Denmark. So we suggested to bring the mermaid to uh, China, um, freaking out the Danish Nationalist Party. So I, um, <laughs> I, I actually had to go uh, to parliament and argue her case. Uh, and as you can see, we, we got her. Uh, then we had to get her through Chinese customs. Uh, and, uh, and, and finally, F finally, she, uh, she arrived uh, as, as this kind of attraction to allow the, the Chinese to feel how sustainability can actually increase uh, enjoyment and, uh, and life quality. Uh, shortly after, uh, uh, we got invited to uh, design the headquarters for the main energy company in Shenzhen. Uh, and uh, we just opened it. Um, the, the sort of the volume was given, we had to do uh, two towers, 110 and 220 meters. Um, but the facade, uh, we designed it like, uh, almost like an Isi Miyake fabric, like a pleated uh, 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 surface. So facing away from the pre predominant direction of the sun, it's all glass. But facing the predominant direction of the sun, it's all opaque. But on average, it's 50-50. So depending on where you see it, it sort of glides from being opaque to being uh, transparent. And this very simple idea reduces the thermal exposure to the sun and the energy consumption for air conditioning with 30%. So without any moving parts or any technology, purely the form of the building makes it perform. So you can say what makes it look elegant is also what makes it perform elegantly. An another sort of way, because you can say as an architect, you're always designing for someone else. Um, you, you're rarely hired by architects because they can do it themselves. So um, you somehow have to find ways of engaging with uh, the people you're designing for. Uh, and uh, in, in one case, we got invited to do a urban space in Copenhagen. It's a one kilometer long urban space in the most ethnically diverse part of Denmark, 60 different nationalities. Um, so we created almost like an urban canvas, what we call the black, the black market. Uh, um, and and th then we thought the idea would be to, to try to tap into this diversity. Um, so in a way, like, very often when you talk about integration uh, in Europe these days, it's like this, the problem of integration, uh, the problem of immigration. But we thought, why don't we actually look at the sort of, the sort of undeniable positive aspects of uh, 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 of immigration. So we 
we reached out to uh, the local community and asked this, the citizen living there to recommend elements from their other home country. So uh, based on this idea that you know, we don't eat Chinese food or Japanese food to be nice to the Japanese, it's because we're craving uh, sashimi or gyoza or uh, miso. Uh, in a similar way, we didn't put a Moroccan fountain uh, in this neighborhood to be nice to the Moroccans, but because they have an incredible tradition for architectural water features. So, so now this is like a part of, uh, uh, of Copenhagen. Uh, there's a Jamaican sound system. Um, so you can connect your phone wirelessly and make spontaneous parties. Um, uh, it, uh, it, it has triggered quite some complaints from the neighborhood, but, uh, <laughs> but it shuts off at 9 p.m., so it's fully within the letter of the law. Um, of course, there's Thai boxing a ring from, from, from Thailand, uh, Iraqi swings, uh, bicycle racks from Finland, um, this like, incredible bus stop from Kazakhstan, way cooler than a typical uh, bus stop in Denmark. We found palm trees in China that actually grow organically in a Danish climate. Uh, there's this Japanese uh, octopus that shows that play also becomes this incredible common denominator transcending culture and language. Um, the, the benches become as almost like a, a safari on social behavior. You have an S-curved love seat from Mexico where you're looking the person you're sitting next to into the eyes. You have a, a Belgian bench where everybody looks away from each other. Um, <laughs> so... Um, even down to the lamps, uh, we, we ended up sort of sampling these neon signs that advertise things you can't buy in Denmark. This is a Qatari dentist, for instance, and like elements from uh, former socialist uh, uh, countries. And we created an app uh, together with uh, 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 Topotec, um, Eins, and Superflex, our collaborators, uh, that sort of tells you the story of each artifact, where it's from, what's it doing here. But, but essentially trying to turn the idea of, of immigration and integration into a positive that actually enriches uh, not only our culture, but also our, our urban environment. Uh, an another way to sort of tailor the architecture to, to its inhabitants is uh, uh, if you sort of try to create the framework for an existing organization. Uh, and over the last couple of years, we've been working with Google trying to Imagine the physical framework for the, uh, the, um, uh, the organization architecture that they already have. So Google is uh, a part of uh, teams uh, of like uh, 30 to 40 people, neighborhoods of 100, 100 to 150 people, communities of up to 500 people. And in the first building uh, 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 we started building for them, we have 3,000 people forming almost like a town. Typically, you have all the support functions, meeting rooms, uh, snack kitchens, labs, etc., that block the floor plate and interrupt the communication between the, the different people. So we thought, let's, let's organize it on two layers. Ima imagine a series of platforms proportioned to a neighborhood of 150 people. The platforms dock together, creating a continuous landscape of 3,000 people, separated by courtyards that are almost like squares in a town. The courtyards. Uh, are one level below where you have all of the busy social activities, the meetings, the labs, the kitchens. So you almost have a Medina uh, or a Casbah on the ground floor, a busy market, and then you have this kind of contemplative attic on top. Finally, we drape a canopy of photovoltaics over the entire space, uh, making sure that we harvest every photon and only allow the perfect amount of daylight to, to reach the building. So the, so the entire facade is actually uh, photovoltaics. Uh, the canopy extends out, inviting people to, uh, to enter. Uh, once you go through the more sort of busy part, you can then enter into the, uh, these little plazas or courtyards. From here, you can ascend uh, up into uh, <clears throat> this kind of continuous uh, environment. <coughs> and the idea is that each team, depending on how a team grows or expands and contracts, they can sort of migrate and spread out combining uh, neighborhood to neighborhoods, and they can even sort of express their own character with a, a sort of a smaller scale of more temporary architecture. So um, this was like, so our first sort of visual, this idea that every photon is converted to power or, or daylight, 
and, and this is what it starts, starts looking like now. Um, I don't know if you can recognize the scale of a person, but it's like normally in a, in a work environment, you, have, you may have a nice lobby, but then you sort of sit and, and, uh, and work in the, in the boondocks. Here, the, where you actually spend most of your time is really this kind of uh, cathedral. Then, of course, we try to transform the same principles, but applying them to the city of London, a, a radically different environment, which, of course, has transformed the architecture quite a bit, uh, but still trying to sort of realize some of the same qualities that we can realize in, um, uh, in Silicon Valley. So um, that, that brings me to the, the sort of the last subject that I'd like to um, talk to uh, uh, before we have a conversation. And that's this notion about how architecture is almost always created by adapting to some existing uh, uh, situations. Um, I think a nice example is a, is a building we are finishing uh, in a couple of months in Vancouver. So it's located right where uh, Granville Bridge touches uh, downtown. You see this trifork that slices the city into these uh, almost useless triangles. We, we started mapping the constraints so we have setbacks from the, from the streets. We have setbacks from the bridges. Then there's almost a deal breaker, which is that we need a 100-foot setback uh, from the bridges because the city wants to ensure that nobody looks straight into the traffic on the bridge. Then there's a park where we shouldn't cast any shadows. And finally, we're left with a tiny footprint uh, of only 6,500 square feet, almost too small to even uh, bother with. Um, so then we got this idea that once we get 100 meters up in the air, we can maintain the minimum distance, but actually grow our floor plate to, uh, to twice the size. This is the result as it looks uh, uh, today. As you, as you drive over the bridge, it's as if someone is pulling a curtain aside, uh, welcoming you to, to Vancouver, or, or like a, a, a wheat growing through the cracks in the pavement and blossoming when it gets light and air. Underneath the bridge, we're trying to turn the negative impact of the bridge into a positive. So we're working with the local artists, including Rodney Graham, to turn the underside of the bridge into what we've sort of nicknamed the Sistine Chapel of street art, uh, like an art gallery upside down. But essentially trying to sort of adapt and in a way sort of almost like reinterpret the, the bridge to become a, a, an asset for, for the life of the city. So here you see this kind of genie uh, uh, growing uh, through the mist and up into uh, to the clouds. But essentially, an, an architecture sort of entirely almost evolved through adaptation to, to the urban uh, environment. So if the underside of a bridge can become an art museum, maybe an art museum can also serve as a bridge. We, we were asked to do a, a small art museum in a sculpture park uh, in, uh, in Norway. And, and we got the idea to use the museum as a bridge to come from one side of the river to the other. So it, it literally sort of rests between the, the, the two embankments. You pass through the museum and then you continue your journey. And, and the museum almost becomes like one of the sculptures in the sculpture park. It, it's gonna open uh, this summer. And, and, and also like, one of the things that you can adapt to uh, as an architect or uh, with architecture is changes. And change can come from, from anywhere, but obviously, uh, as you were probably well reminded of after a few days at South by Southwest, it, it often comes from technology. Uh, uh, and in this case, uh, clean technology. Uh, uh, in one month, we are opening a power plant in Copenhagen uh, that is going to be the cleanest waste to energy power plant in the world. So clean that there are no toxins coming out of the chimney. So we thought like, how can we celebrate this invisible fact? And we thought, it's, it's such a big building. It's the tallest and biggest building in Copenhagen. Um, in Denmark, as you can see, we have snow. It's a cold climate, but we have no mountains. We have to drive six hours to get to the south of Sweden to find an alpine ski slope, but because the power plant is so huge, we can actually put two-thirds uh, of the Swedish ski slope on the roof of the power plant. Uh, so that's what we did. Um, this, uh, this is um, a few months ago, uh, a group of Danish professional skiers uh, had this kind of exhilarating experience of, uh, of skiing 
uh, at home uh, for the first time ever. Uh, and um, and uh, at, at least one of them, very excited, claimed that it's exactly like skiing on the Austrian Alps. Um, I'll take it. Um, but I think it also kind of shows this kind of incredible world-changing impact that architecture can have. Uh, because like, uh, I had a son three months ago, and um, this, this power plant, the ski slope, opens in one month. So he's probably not going to remember anything for like another year or two. So he will never know, really, that there was a time when you couldn't ski on the roofs of the power plants in Copenhagen. Uh, so imagine if his baseline and his generation baselines becomes taking for granted that, of course, power plants, that's where you ski. Then imagine what they will be capable of imagining for, for their future. So um, right next to the, uh, to the power plant, we, we actually created uh, our smallest project to, to date. Um, and it's, it's, it's almost like trying to hijack uh, the global infrastructure of container shipping, because containers are these incredibly standardized, universally uh, 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 available room-sized elements that are designed to stack up to, up to eight floors. Uh, once they've traveled around the, wor the world a few times, you can buy them for $2,000 in Amsterdam. So we got the idea to take nine of these containers, we chose a nice color, uh, stack them, uh, not for efficiency, but to create a community, uh, sail them across uh, the Baltic Sea into the port of Copenhagen, uh, and dock them as the first specimen of, of a, a, a company we've called Urban Rigger, that is essentially creating student homes uh, uh, in the middle of the port. So a lot of university cities have port areas that are transforming, so the students here can have like this lovely, uh, you know, almost like a waterfront, uh, or literally waterfront view. Uh, they can jump from their window into the clean port of Copenhagen. They can even get back uh, inside uh, and get dry. Um, so almost like that, it's, it's probably, in some of, some of their cases, going to be the nicest home they'll ever have. Um, <laughs> so there's a, a roof, a, a shared roof terrace, photovoltaics that drive heat pumps in the floating uh, pontoon below that actually extracts heat from the port water. Uh, and so the entire um, uh, home for, for 12 students is powered by the sun and is heated by the excess heat from, uh, from the water. So almost like a floating uh, miniature ecosystem. Uh, so the next uh, seven uh, of these are coming to Copenhagen. Uh, then uh, a community of two to 300 homes in uh, Gothenburg is following and potentially a small floating uh, uh, village for the Olympics in Paris. So essentially this, this idea of a, of a deployable fleet that of course can be used to begin with to solve student uh, housing, but of course can also be deployed in regions that suddenly have an urgency uh, to house uh, uh, large populations. So, so staying in this sort of idea of the transformation of our ports, um, uh, what is it by now? I think six years ago, uh, Hurricane Sandy came uh, and wiped out uh, a big part of Lower Manhattan. Um, shortly after, we got invited to see if we could come up with ideas of how to respond to uh, the necessary uh, flood protection requirements, make, make the city of Manhattan more resilient. Um, and we thought, how can we imagine protecting Manhattan, keeping it dry, without creating a wall segregating the life of the city from the water around it? And we got inspired by the High Line, the High Line in New York, which is the second most popular park in New York by now. Uh, it's essentially decommissioned train tracks that now that they're no longer train tracks have become this kind of amazing space for the social life uh, uh, and the environment. So we thought, what if we don't have to wait until we decommission the resiliency infrastructure of Manhattan before it becomes nice? Uh, so we suggested to the city of New York that we would take all of the necessary flood protection measures, but design them in dialogue with the local communities to um, create a, a waterfront that not only is going to keep Manhattan dry, but also make it more enjoyable and more accessible to the people living there. And, and we've made this a short film where you can see some of the people we worked with uh, uh, in this process, like their experience during Sandy and some of their dreams for uh, uh, for their future neighborhood. That was actually why Sandy was 
so bad is uh, because of the phase of the moon, it was already a very large high tide, as well as the storm surge coming in with the, the wind and the tide lining up perfectly to give us 14 foot tides <laughs> instead of eight foot. I'd like to see some type of flood protection in this area. Um, that's going to happen. Um, we're vulnerable, obviously, being as close to the water. Something that just brings like uh, more walks, different walks of life, you know. Uh, another escape from just the busyness and the hustle and bustle. There's this great space that could really become community space, cultural space, and, and, and active uses. Everyone enjoys space. And uh, in New York and other congested cities, it's hard to come by. Anything that makes the cities greener is just such a wonderful thing for not only the environment, but the people that live in the city, too, to be able to be around that space. Uh, the plans, the berming, the sense of how it can become into the natural landscape itself, uh, how we want to program that is, uh, is, is, is really the next challenge. We are the link, we are the tip in the sense of the big U. It's important that the entire waterfront of Lower Manhattan uh, build in the plans that have been put forward because we can not only fortify this great city of New York, but be a model for cities all over the world. So the dry line is, is an attempt to um, make the necessary climate adaptations for New York City, but actually at the same time making the city more lively and more enjoyable for the, for the people living there. Uh, uh, phase one of the dry line, uh, the, the whole East River portion, uh, is scheduled to break ground uh, uh, next year. Um, so the challenges that Manhattan and New York is facing uh, is a challenge that by 2050, 90% of the sort of world's mega cities are going to be facing this kind of exposure to, uh, to rising sea levels. Um, Miami is, is famously uh, fl flooding more and more sort of frequently. It's almost like a, uh, like a daily weather event. Uh, uh, Venice, uh, uh, obviously. Uh, and, and actually, on a daily basis, there's already almost 3 million people living permanently at sea. Um, there's a handful of experimental cities across the globe that are trying to deal with some of the challenges of the sort of sustainable development goals of, of the United Nations. For instance, uh, the Hafen city in, uh, in Germany, which is a floodproof city. The, the ground floors are designed to be able to flood. A clean water city where the landscapes clean the water in uh, Hammerbüschestadt uh, outside Stockholm. Solar city in Germany. So we thought, could we maybe combine some of the ideas that we've been working on <clears throat> to imagine uh, a new city that could respond to all of the 17 sustainable development goals uh, of the United Nations? So in a way, learning from the sort of organic, uh, uh, self-growing, uh, uh, compact uh, nature of, uh, of, of various uh, sort of historical human habitats, also learning from nature, harvesting sun, capturing water, having a, a sort of a, a, a modular adaptive growth, um, and essentially almost like scaling some of the ideas we did with uh, the urban rigor uh, social housing up to uh, uh, a city scale. So in a way to create 
a kit of parts of effective agriculture, aquaponics, hydroponics, to be able to supply all the food that is necessary to harvest, uh, recycle, and clean the water uh, to create uh, a man-made uh, uh, water ecosystem, to harvest uh, energy in any way, shape, or form. We can get our hands on it uh, strictly with renewable sources. And finally, create almost an urban metabolism where we can deal with the va waste, turn some of it into energy, recycle the elements we can, almost have a, 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 an anaerobic digester to, to really turn uh, 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 waste, organic waste into, uh, into an energy source. So, so really come up with a, a, a self-sustaining, sustainable uh, a c a community. So we scaled up the, the, the barge of the urban rigger to 500 feet in diameter. Um, uh, it, it, the hexagonal uh, shape gives it a good sort of trilateral stability. Uh, it's designed to be able to uh, withstand a Category 5 cyclone. So it, it's, it's a sturdy island. Of course, uh, it has the buoyancy to carry uh, 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 the urban population on top. It's still completely possible to prefabricate it and then tow it to a location where you can tie it to uh, an archipelago uh, of similar islands. And then we manage that we can have these uh, productive and, and social edges. Imagine a whole vocab of edges that are tailored to make each island uh, unique, even if it has uh, a rationality in the way it's made. Uh, on top, to keep the scale almost like European in scale, because you want to keep the center of gravity relatively low so you don't tumble over if you're a floating island. We can have some space dedicated to, to agriculture. Uh, uh, we want to expand uh, uh, the roofs. The, the first sort of uh, ideas, um, uh, the first specimen of this floating community is designed for a subtropical or tropical climate. So there's a, a rich ability to harvest sun power, uh, but also uh, a desire to create shade, uh, use light materials, renewable wood, bamboo. Uh, of course, any configuration of architecture on top of this island uh, should be possible. Uh, we want to maximize outdoor space uh, because we are a small island. We want to create as much uh, a space for the, for the citizens as possible. And then we have this barge underneath it where we can uh, uh, store uh, energy, uh, photovoltaic panels, uh, vertical axis windmills on the roofs, uh, uh, sort of freshwater autonomy with the whole system of rainwater collection and recycling, uh, uh, a closed loop waste treatment facility, uh, uh, some, some agriculture outdoors, some in greenhouse, and some using uh, grow lamps in a basement as a kind of backup. Uh, we can even have vertical farming under, underneath, uh, like sea farming, uh, seaweed, uh, um, uh, f uh, fish farming. Um, so it can also start actually creating habitat uh, uh, and a reef. So, so this kind of sustainable floating island can then, of course, be docked with uh, some other islands to create a, a little neighborhood that can then can sort of create a town, in this case, uh, capable of housing 10,000 uh, inhabitants. Uh, so, of course, when you get the size of a town, you can sort of thematically program some of the islands to have other functions that are more for the, for the whole neighborhood. Uh, and then, of course, also by, by creating a, a little family of outposts, we can create water breaks. Uh, and these outposts can be recreative or productive uh, uh, uninhabited uh, uh, islands. So, um, again, like a, a whole little family of, of elements to, to create this kind of uh, archipelago. So, so that's essentially the idea. Imagine uh, a, a town of 10,000 people where you move around uh, on the water. You have the, the local block. You have the sort of neighborhood, uh, and you have the entire city. You have an inner harbor with all the cultural and, and social facilities. And then, of course, like an out, outer harbor that is where you, you arrive and, uh, and dock. So the smallest <coughs> cell, <coughs> the neighborhood, and the town. Uh, and, and of course, it's created in a kind of organic way. So you can imagine uh, this little friendly guy for uh, 10,000 residents. If it, if it becomes uh, a success, you can see the scale of Manhattan uh, by comparison. Uh, you can add a few more. This would be 60,000 people living uh, here, uh, 360,000, and 2.5 and million people uh, living in a sort of maritime uh, metropolis. So, um, so if you sort of uh, zoom in, Arriving at this uh, floating community, the, the first one is uh, planned to be realized in the Pearl River Delta. 
uh, 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 adjacent to, to Hong Kong in a kind of somewhat protected waters, you'll start seeing this, this whole family of alternate ways of moving around, uh, a sort of a whole family of electric vehicles for the water, for the land, and for, for the air. Um, you'll find, uh, you know, fish markets and, uh, uh, and, and, and green markets down by the, the neighborhood uh, port. Uh, you can move through uh, productive landscapes as parks. Also, we imagine the greenhouses can be like orangeries that you can enjoy uh, as a social space, but also a productive space. Um, and, and essentially imagine this as a kind of sargasso city that really could be the seed uh, of, of a future uh, uh, maritime metropolis. Uh, to begin with, uh, uh, as, as a completely uh, urban integrated project uh, connected to a nearby ur urban area, but of course also with the possibility that fleets uh, of these islands can be deployed uh, in places where you suddenly need to rehouse a large population because of uh, uh, some kind of environmental Im impact or, or, or conflict. Um, so, so um, as we're assuming uh, out in, in scale, um, uh, the last project is may maybe a response to uh, the fact that an architect can some sometimes become a little bit bored with the fact that the rules of architecture are always the same. Um, you know, the, the, the science is the same everywhere. Uh, you know, gravity falls down, water flows down. Um, but, but sometimes some of the rules can change if you uh, go to another planet. Uh, and what, what other planet to go to than our most immediate neighbor, uh, Mars? Because just imagine, uh, 500 years ago, it took Magellan 500 years, uh, like uh, three months <laughs> to sail from uh, Spain to Brazil. Three months, that's the same time it's gonna take us to go from Earth to Mars. Uh, and, and that sort of commute time didn't really prevent the Europeans from going to the Americas. So, um, I don't think it's gonna stop us from going to, to Mars. Also, just looking a little bit at how, how Mars actually is, uh, Mars has um, relatively temperate temperatures on a nice summer day by equator on Mars. It can be 70 degrees Fahrenheit. That's like a, a nice Danish summer day. Uh, it gets a lot colder though. Um, gravity is very light, so if a person weighs 100 pounds and, and goes to Mars, uh, 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 they're, they're gonna weigh 38 pounds, uh, the, the fastest diet you can, you can go through. Uh, by comparison, if we go to Jupiter, uh, the same person would, would weigh 253 pounds. Um, so, uh, and then maybe a miracle, the seasonal tilt of, uh, of Mars is almost the exact same as, as Earth. The tilt is what gives us the five, or the four seasons. Uh, Mars has the exact same seasons, they're just a little bit longer twice as long because a mass year is twice as long. Uh, and then the miracle is every life form on Earth has adapted to a 24-hour life cycle. We have the same 24-hour cycle on Mars, except we actually get 40 minutes more uh, to snooze uh, in the morning. Um, and, and just to tell you how incredibly lucky this is, uh, on Mercury, uh, um, the day is not 24 hours, it's 175 days. So when the sun sets, it's 88 days before it rises again. Um, so this is, this is a miracle. Mars does not have a unified magnetic field, so it has a little bit of an issue with radiation. But if you compare to all of the other alternatives, Mars is doing, uh, is doing pretty well. Um, also, Mars has half the radius of Earth but because it has no liquid oceans, it has the same amount of real estate. Um, <laughs> of course, the blue planet, the red planet, but actually, if you strip away all the liquid water and the biosphere, you can see on the left that Earth is also a red planet. We have very much the same minerals uh, available. Uh, Mars just doesn't have a biosphere. Um, and then a, a, an amazing thing, we already know, know the beauty uh, of the sort of the sunset on Earth where the sun goes red. On Mars, it's the opposite. Because of small particles in the air, uh, the sunsets are blue on the red planet. Something I hope that a lot of people in this room will one day experience firsthand. Um, and we've actually been going to Mars uh, ever since the 60s frequently 
So we've seen all kinds of things. We've seen the poles expand and contract uh, with, uh, with ice. We've seen craters. We've seen lava flows frozen. We've seen uh, dried out archipelagos. We've seen landslides, tornadoes across the, the surface of the planet. And we've been actually having uh, wheels on the ground uh, for, for, for decades. So we have a, a lot of footage. Uh, we've even seen frost uh, uh, on the desert in the morning, just like you can experience it here on, on Earth. So, um, of course, there's a lot of things going for Mars, but we have a few challenges. Too much radiation for humans, but not for plants. Uh, very little pressure, very low temperatures, no breathable air, and no ready-to-use water. So th there is something to work with. Um, <laughs> so, so how can we survive? <clears throat> and, and just looking at Earth, so this is uh, uh, Matmata in Tunisia, what looks like a, a lifeless desert is actually a very lively community of these uh, buildings that are carved out uh, uh, of the bedrock, uh, harvesting the thermal stability of, uh, uh, of the ground, uh, having like protection from uh, the, the strong burning sun, creating these kind of cozy interiors using the local materials. Um, <clears throat> another example is the, the canyon lands in Arizona. Again, it looks empty, but when you look under the shelves of the rocks protecting from the uh, radiation of the sun, the heat, uh, a community uh, sort of nested into, uh, into the rocks. <clears throat> and, and finally, in the Arctic, Kangalusuak in Greenland, uh, again sort of responding to the extreme cold, the spherical form of the igloo, minimizing ex uh, thermal, uh, thermal exposure by minimizing the envelope for the largest possible area, using the insulating uh, attributes of snow. Um, so anyway, what we need to do is discover a new Martian vernacular architecture. Um, and because it's going to cost a fortune to bring anything to, uh, to Mars, and, and buildings are by definition very heavy, uh, we somehow have to try to work with what we have. First of all, if we look at what one person needs, two liters of water and some, uh, some energy, the only way we can efficiently deliver this is to become vegans. So Martians are vegans. Uh, and then basically what we need to do is we need to combine the ecosystem required to sustain human life with the ecosystem required to sustain plant life into one unified ecosystem. And basically, if we look at what do we have on Mars, we have regolith. It consists of some basalts, some, some sands. We can sort of start sorting the regolith. Uh, we get some frozen uh, water that, of course, can provide liquid water. Uh, uh, we get some rocks. Uh, we get some sand. The water and the sand can be used to create bricks, concrete, and ceramics. Uh, so we can start building, uh, building things. Uh, we can sort the sand uh, and get some, uh, some iron oxide, some uh, aluminum, some silicia. Um, the aluminum uh, uh, and, the, uh, um, and the sands can be used to create glass and, uh, and aluminum technology, uh, uh, photovoltaics. Photovoltaics can generate power. And with power and water, we can make uh, electrolysis that splits water molecules into hydrogen and oxygen. Uh, we have a 93% CO2 atmosphere on Mars. So the CO2 uh, combined with the, the hydrogen allows us to have a Sabachi uh, reactor that cre creates methane uh, that is a perfect rocket propellant together with, uh, with water. So we can actually go, go back home. Uh, we get some, uh, some more water as a byproduct, and we get some uh, carbon monoxide. Uh, together with the iron ore, we can create steel. We can then start to create plastics, hard plastics. We can make soft plastics. Uh, of course, we're going to recycle everything we make because we, everything is, is, is very precious. We can then make uh, uh, transparent uh, membranes that we can use to create inflatable environments where we can then have a breathable atmosphere. With this, we can grow plants. Uh, we can have root zone uh, facilities that, that clean the water, so we can also start playing with the water. Uh, uh, we can have aquaponics, hydroponics. We can grow food. And finally, we can sustain human life. So, uh, so actually, bringing nothing, we actually have all of the ingredients to create a, a man-made ecosystem on Mars. Uh, of course, we have to be a little bit more space uh, efficient. Also, there's the radiation issue, uh, uh, that it's too much radiation uh, uh, 
to be outdoor uh, all the time. Uh, but then we found out that the typical American only spends 7.6% of their day uh, outdoor. So if we say, if we, say if we spend 20% uh, in full exposure, uh, then we are actually uh, fine. Um, then we looked at uh, different, different strategies. Inflatable membranes are great for keeping uh, a contained uh, 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 pressurized environment, but they don't resist uh, meteors. Uh, 3D printed structures are, uh, sort of provide ad added uh, uh, protection, but it's not really uh, as, as airtight. And finally, uh, excavation into the rock provides full protection from radiation, but it's not very nice to live uh, 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 underground. So each idea is not really adequate on its own, but combined, they actually uh, uh, function. So imagine day one, you create a, a, a sort of pressurized perimeter. You start excavating material to create spaces underground. You use that material to 3D print uh, uh, new structures. You then have to watch how much time you spent uh, in the different areas. And, and then these sort of habitats can slowly grow uh, together uh, and form larger uh, and larger uh, uh, communities. So, so the, the idea of this project, we've been doing it for the Dubai Future Foundation uh, under the Mass 2117 program. And as the name suggests, it's the idea of putting a city on Mars by 2117. Even for an architect, uh, that's a very uh, uh, long schedule. So. Um, <laughs> To get going, uh, we, um, uh, we're going to make a prototype in the middle of something that looks a lot like Mars, although it is a lot hotter than Mars. It's going to be the Mars Science City. It's going to be a facility for research, for knowledge exchange, for education, and for exhibitions related to Mars. And it's going to be built using the same techniques that we imagine will be deployed on Mars. So you can see that living on Mars is not going to be like living in a tin can. It's going to have this charming reddish 3D printed uh, 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 architecture. Also, water is, is actually one of the best protections against radiation. So one meter of water protects the same as seven meters of rock. So you might as well have these big underground uh, ballrooms full of light coming through uh, water tanks. Uh, and then, of course, different exhibitions trying to sort of uh, educate and promote uh, uh, ultra-efficient agriculture suitable for, for a mass uh, habitat. So just to sort of conclude, wh why this, what are we going to gain uh, from going to Mars? Because we, we obviously have challenges on Earth. But if you look at the 17 Sustainable Development Goals of the United Nations, eight of them deal directly with the built environment. And for instance, on Earth, we have one and a half billion cubic meters of water. On Mars, we only have five million. So we have to be extremely water efficient on Mars. We have an abundance of space on Earth. By comparison, we have to be much more compact on Mars. Uh, and one of the main sources of our challenges on Earth right now is our addiction to fossil fuel. On Mars, you have no fossil fuels. So in a way, it's very likely that the answers to our challenges on Earth may be found on, uh, on Mars. And imagine in a century or two, we'll actually notice that even the red planet is also potentially a blue uh, and a green planet. And just to sort of uh, finish up, I, I love this idea that um, th they say that, um, that astronauts that have had this sort of experience of looking at uh, Earth from space get this kind of shift in their consciousness and their awareness uh, uh, about uh, our situation uh, as a species on a planet. So imagine the kind of feeling of universal citizenry that our children or grandchildren are going to feel when they stand and stare at the night sky of the planet that they now call home, uh, looking at this tiny blue dot, which is what Earth is going to look like from Mars, and being reminded uh, of our earthly origin, but also being sort of reassured about uh, our galactic uh, destiny. <laughs> Thank you.
so uh, I know that there are some microphones if anyone has a verbal question. Uh, other otherwise, there are some questions uh, here that, uh, that I can deal with. Um, like, 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 uh, currently, uh, uh, we, we, uh, we, we've narrowed our scope to, to look, at, uh, look at Manhattan. Um, but but if you, the, the question was if we were also looking at the Brooklyn waterfront. Uh, I mean, obviously, Brooklyn has, has had the energy of, um, uh, of the Brooklyn uh, Bridge Park that has been established. Uh, and now it has a crazy uh, idea about uh, uh, el eliminating uh, for 10 years uh, the, the Bro Brooklyn Heights promenade. Uh, and we are actually actively trying to see if we can come up with a, uh, with a solution that can solve the BQE and also uh, the resilience of, uh, of the city. Um, m more on that uh, to follow. Um, then, um, I, I don't know, th there's, there's some questions here. There's one that says, what's the project that's closest to your heart and why? Um, the answer is, uh, you should never ask a mother to choose between her children. Um, <laughs> But, but, but I think maybe a, 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 more accurate, a more specific answer could be that I think, like any other architect, uh, I dream of doing you know, concert halls and uh, uh, art museums and uh, operas and cu cultural palaces that have, uh, that have the ambition and, and sometimes the budget to, uh, to make amazing public spaces. Um, uh, so if there's anyone out there. Um, <laughs> Uh, but I think it is interesting that, you know, a typical city, it, it has maybe a town hall, it has maybe like a church, uh, it has maybe a museum, but 99% of the city is where we go to work, where we live, where we go to school, uh, where we go uh, to buy our groceries, so the kind of everyday. And I think if, if only the 1%, the cultural palaces, the public buildings, contribute to the city in a, in a public way, then we're going to end up living in a, you know, a, a very poor urban environment. So I think actually the 99%, the, uh, the power plants, uh, the affordable homes, uh, the, 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 the student homes, those, those projects that are normally not really registering on the spectrum of architecture, they actually are this incredible resource that if we, if, we, if we think about them carefully, we can actually create something completely extraordinary out of all the ordinary. Uh, uh, and I think uh, wh while waiting for, for, the, for the Opera House commissions, we are, we are perfectly happy uh, 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 sort of making the ordinary more extraordinary. I have a question at the microphone back here. Um, so how do you form a sense of creative urgency uh, in your teams to create such rich narratives in your projects? Yeah, I, I think actually um, uh, recently we have tried to distill what we do into uh, what is almost like a big recipe. Uh, and uh, I'm going to give it to you so, so you can do it yourself. Um, so basically every project has to start by identifying a change that is happening in the world that has relevance to this project. Uh, because, and there's a lot of change going on, and you can often just take things for granted, because I think the only reason that you are not, because you can say, like, there's been architecture for quite a while, like a few millennia, uh, so there's some pretty nice buildings uh, already there. So the reason you, you don't just find the perfect building that has already been built and do one more of them is that everything is always changing. So once you identify change, suddenly you can address the consequences, the conflicts, the problems, the potentials that arise from this change. Uh, and then secondly, every project has to give a gift. Uh, of course, if what you're doing is form giving, you have to form give a gift. Uh, and a gift is essentially not philanthropy, but it is to respond to the ask uh, of the client or, uh, or the tenants or the users, whatever, uh, with something that goes above and beyond what they asked for. Because by doing that, as an architect, it's very hard to have agency because we don't decide ourselves what we're doing. We have to somehow design for, to accommodate other people's uh, needs and desires. 
but if, if every time we do it, we identify a change, we respond to that change, and we give a gift that is more than what we were asked for, then slowly, project by project, you end up creating uh, a more exciting uh, uh, human habitat. I have one more question here. Um, oh, here. Well, somewhat you answered uh, what I wanted to ask, but maybe, maybe not so. Um, what's your thought process? Um, you have a very interesting way of thinking, and all that sort of comes up in the architecture. And if there is a particular um, part of the thought process that's most interest to you? What, what is the, um, the, the part of the thought process? Yeah, the thought process in actually building the, the, the project uh, and coming up with the ideas, because um, you connect the dots that I haven't seen a lot of architects do and make to make the project very distinctly different to um, it stands out. Yeah, yeah I, I, think, I think it's actually, uh, I think um, mo maybe more than, more than many, we have a, a profound uh, belief that the world is already incredibly exciting. And every day is already full of incredibly exciting elements. Uh, and if you look and listen and find a way to look at all the things you already know and therefore already take for granted and therefore have a hard time seeing, like you can't see the forest for all the trees, uh, you, you can sometimes discover that sitting in plain uh, sight, the everyday, if put together in a slightly different way, can actually uh, become sort of a, almost like a, a celebration, not by adding any new ingredients, but simply uh, you, you can call it architectural alchemy, that you uh, create gold, or at least life, by mixing traditional ingredients in untraditional ways. And I think it starts by having the conviction that, that every day is already exciting enough. All we have to do is, is discover and rediscover it. Um, I, I found a nice one uh, here. Uh, how do you ensure that your presented idea is not interpreted as complete BS. Uh, yeah, yeah, exactly. Uh, it, I mean, we often fail at that, I have to say. Uh, but but uh, I, I think if you're trying to do things differently, you have to be even more diligent and dutiful in, in making sure that all the practical uh, 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 issues are addressed. So I think, ironically, rather than you know, thinking outside the box and not being encumbered by uh, restrictions, we obsess about the restrictions because it's only, you know, the devil is in the detail, it's only by really digging into uh, the specifics that you can find the recipe for something uh, interesting. There was another one actually, um, the examples you gave tackle how to deal with the problem rather than how, to, how do we eliminate it. Why have you chosen this approach? I mean, I, I, think, uh, I think at this point, there is, there is no silver bullet, and like, almost like all aspects of, uh, of human uh, uh, creativity and ingenuity uh, has to be mobilized. So we will have to uh, deal with source issues, but also we will have to deal with uh, uh, response issues, because uh, Sandy did wipe out uh, a good part of, uh, 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 of New York and, uh, and cost lives uh, uh, and paralyzed the city for, uh, uh, for, for, for weeks and months. So, so there is already an impact we have to deal with. And at the same time, of course, we have to be as ingenious and as creative as we can with, with dealing with the root causes. Uh, but I actually think that the entire family of projects that we are, are are doing that deal with hedonistic sustainability are exactly trying to imagine a future and to deliver a future that is more desirable but also uh, more environmentally performing. So I think it's not one or the other, it's, it's both and. We have 21 seconds. <laughs> I'm, I'd be curious to hear your thoughts on virtual reality and building virtual spaces potentially and how our learnings um, in architecture and the physical world will potentially inform spaces that don't really rely on physical rules, if that's something you're interested in. Yeah, actually, I'll, I'll make a very quick uh, answer to uh, a very complex question. 
but um, we have actually been working quite a bit with uh, 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 with, with virtual uh, reality. Uh, um, uh, s some of our friends um, w within um, have uh, we've worked with them to create a, a museum for virtual art uh, to try to find out the, what would be the spatial experience if the art doesn't actually have to be some artifacts in a room. Um, but I think I would say what's very exciting to, to be an architect right now is that I would say the last four decades, all of the engine of innovation that is Silicon Valley has been caught up in the immaterial. And finally, it is as if there is a door that is opening and all of that ingenuity is coming into physical space with the Internet of Things, uh, with the idea of the mirror world, uh, suddenly not just information or social relations, but actually everything else is becoming sensory and, and available to the power of, of algorithms. Uh, and I think suddenly architecture and physical space is acquiring a relevance that it, that it hasn't had for, for four decades. Uh, and I'm extremely excited to be alive still uh, at this point where maybe my profession again become, uh, becomes relevant. <laughs>